afternoon. I'm Paulette Lichtman Panzer, um, a member of Holly, um, and also um, a member of the board of Fall for the Book. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Jane Hampton Cook to you. Um, she makes biographies and history relevant to today's news, current events, issues of faith, and modern day life. Jane is the author of about eight books, including American Phoenix, which we have up for sale here and which she will be happy to sign. It's about John Quincy Adams and Louisa and the War of 1812. And she also has a soft cover book here called The Star Spangled Story, which is celebrating 200 years of our national anthem. Uh, Jane has authored several books, Stories of Faith and Courage from the Revolutionary War, the Faith of America's First Ladies, and she co-authored stories of faith and courage from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as a, an aside, she's also a former White House webmaster. So Jane, we're welcome to have you today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming, and thank you to Fall for the Book for hosting today and to the Osher um, Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason. I just really appreciate it, and also to C-SPAN for being here as well. Um, she mentioned my books. These are some cover images of some of them. Um, this one I have here today and this one, but these are all available online and through bookstores. Um, and my passion really is to bring history to life in ways that are real and relevant to our lives today. You know, we can't relate to what it's like to ride in a carriage everywhere, but we can understand what it's like um, for our families to be separated from one another by distance. And so that's the, what I try to focus on, are those things that we still have in common with people who've gone, gone before us. And uh, just to, as a way of mention before, she mentioned um, that I worked at the White House for a few years, and I was President George W. Bush's webmaster. Um, and this was in the era of President Clinton was the first president to have a website. So this was the second president, and it was the first time we transitioned websites from president to president. So it was an exciting time. It was before broadband and smartphones and things like that, and technology has really changed a lot since 2001. But I had a love for writing before we moved up here to Washington, D.C., and I had written a little book about Sam Houston and his daughter Maggie. It was my first book. Um, it was a children's book. But it didn't come out until 2002 while I was working in the White House. And so you can imagine um, just the excitement of having your first book in print. And so, um, but I was really sweating it because the night before, um, I was supposed to leave to go to the Texas Book Festival in Austin, and I was going straight from the office to the airport, and I, only, I didn't have my books yet. And I got home, and sure enough, there was a box of books, and I finally had my first copy, and I was really nervous that I wasn't going to have a copy to take with me to this book festival. Well, so I go to the office the next day, and I'm, I was housed in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which is next door to the West Wing. It's that big Victorian era building. So I was very excited, and we're going to pretend that this is the book. Um, and I wanted to go show it to a friend of mine in another office. And I walked out into the hallway, and there was nobody around except for a Secret Service agent standing to the side with just the curly Q cord coming out of his ear, and I knew he was Secret Service. And they don't normally just stand around inside the building, so I thought, somebody's coming. Now, when you're a White House staffer and the president is walking through, that's not your time to chit-chat with him. You're supposed to stand to the side and let him pass. And you can smile and wave, but you're not supposed to, you know, stop him. It's just an unwritten rule that you figure out pretty quickly. Well, I was really excited about my book, and sure enough, the doors open and President Bush starts walking straight toward me. And without really thinking, I didn't say anything to him, I just did this. <laughs> and he saw me do this and he came over and he started flipping through the book. And then I thought, oh, I've gotta make sure he understands this is not about him. That this is about Sam Houston, governor of Texas before you know Civil War. And so he's flipping through it and I'm telling him about my book. And then he looks at me and he says, well, I need an autograph. And I realized he thinks I'm giving it to him. 
And I'm really not because I needed it to go to Austin within a couple hours. And I thought, what do you do if the president of the United States thinks you're giving him a book? You better give him the book. And so um, I was so nervous. And I said to him, sir, would you like me to sign this for you now or later? And he gave me that puzzled look like, what? And then he, then he goes, then he figured it out. He goes, later. I was like, Phew. So he goes on his merry way. I go on my merry way. And I go to Austin, and I do the book festival with my book. And then when I got back, I photocopied the inside cover a couple times and practiced what I was going to say to him in the space, you know, that I had. And then I, I, once I had it down, I wrote, my, my, wrote a little note and sent it over to the Oval Office and got a really nice note back from him. And so that's a, my, um, I've never given a pre- book to the President of the United States before since, since then. Um, so it's really nice to have that as my first book to, to share with um, the President. And you just never get to do that. So um, now I fell in love, though, in working at the White House. I really fell in love with White House history. I found that for the White House website, I could write about White House history, and it was bipartisan. So it didn't matter what your political affiliation was. You could come to the White House website and read about biographies of the president. You could read about the rooms of the White House. And so I really became enthralled with the history of our presidents and first ladies in our in our White House. And that was what launched my um, desire to go on and write about American history. I received a fellowship from the White House Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians to to do um, some research on the White House. And so I left my job in 2003 and started pursuing writing. And what, um, what um, I fell in love also a few years ago with this story about John Quincy and Louisa Adams in the War of 1812. And so that's what I want to focus on today is this story. Um, this is a picture of John Quincy Adams as a younger man. Um, he's a young diplomat with lots of hair. Um, at the time this time he doesn't keep that hair for very long but um, so what I want to do is just start with July 4th 1809 it's Independence Day and we're gonna hone in on Boston Boston is a town of 33,000 people it's the fourth largest city in the United States but Adams is not a very happy fellow because he um, he'd lost his dream job a year earlier in the US Senate he's teaching at Harvard at this time He's a practicing law, and to you and I, that would be perfectly respectable if that's what we did with our lives. The rest of our life is teach and practice law, but when you're the son of John Adams, and if you're not serving the public, nothing else compares. So he's really lost his dream job, and really his wife talked in her diaries about how miserable, frankly, it was to live with him during this time period because he was just very unhappy. But this makes him very relatable because we all know someone who's lost their job or who's had to change jobs and maybe didn't want to. And this is what makes him relatable is is just that, that angst of losing sort of your purpose in life and having to do something you don't really want to be doing. So how did he lose his dream job? Well, in 1807, the British Navy attacked the USS Chesapeake right off the coast of Norfolk. Three were killed, 18 were wounded, and four were impressed or kidnapped. So the British Navy captain seized four of the men on that ship and accused them all of being British deserters. In fact, two of them were legitimate American citizens. And this was called impressment, the the practice of taking someone and forcing them into the British Navy. This is what John Quincy Adams thought about impressment. He thought that the impressment of seamen is to all intents and purposes a practice as unjust, immoral, base, and oppressive and tyrannical as the slave trade. And he was someone who opposed slavery. But he thought it was just abominable to take someone and rob them of their citizenship and force them into a military that could potentially be at war with that person's native country. And that was awful to him. So the practice of impressment was going on because Britain 
was at war with France, and they needed every man they could get. And some of the men that they impressed were legitimate British deserters, but many of them were American citizens. And there, the State Department estimates about 5,000 men were impressed during this time period. John Quincy Adams thinks that the number was low, and there was a lot that was unreported. He thinks the number was more around nine.